Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Um, today I'm here to talk about how we're using virtual reality to treat uh, lazy eye and crossed eye, as well as um, measure other diseases of vision. Um, so my story kind of begins, this is me when I was uh, less than a year old. I was diagnosed with a lazy eye and a crossed eye. Um, so I grew up doing all the typical treatments. I had to wear an eye patch, I had to do eye exercises. Uh, whenever an adult left the room, I'd take the eye patch off. Um, I could constantly complain about the eye exercises, so my parents uh, kind of stopped forcing me to do it. Um, and when I was 10, they told me that I was too old, that the treatments didn't work, um, probably because I wasn't really doing them, and um, I wouldn't be able to, to be in 3D vision. Um, so fast forward uh, a number of years, and the movie Avatar came out. And um, I was watching this movie, and people may recall that uh, they, were, they were using a new kind of 3D projector. Um, and they happened to have some issues with the projectors. And the issue uh, at this theater, at the theater I was at, not this one, but <laughs> the one I was at, um, was that the right eye camera was flickering off and on. And it, it just so happens that uh, my weak eye is my left eye, my good eye is my right eye. And so every time that happened, I would see something kind of like this. Um, the, the, the right eye camera would flash to this uh, kind of grayish blue, and I would lose uh, a whole big part of the, the image. Um, and I could still see some stuff on, on the left-hand side. Um, and so while this was happening, I kind of realized that um, what I was seeing was which parts of the image each eye was contributing to my perception. Um, and so when the right eye camera flashed, this, this uh, you know, gray area was the part my right eye was seeing, the, the part my left eye uh, can't, couldn't contribute to. And this bit of peripheral vision on the left was the part that my weak eye was seeing. Um, and so that kind of got me thinking. And um, I thought for you know, four or five years <laughs> until the Oculus Rift came out. Um, and when it did, I built this. Um, and so what, what this is, is we're seeing the left eye image and the right eye image. And I was able to make the cube in my left eye brighter and the cube in my right eye dimmer. Um, and at a certain threshold, um, at first about 10 to 20 times brighter in my weak eye, um, I, I, suddenly I stopped suppressing or ignoring my weak eye and instead um, I saw something like this. And um, so I was basically trying to control this effect to get an understanding of what was going on with my vision. Um, and in this case, since the right eye image is dark and the left eye image is bright, um, I would see this dark um, sphere, or not sphere, circle, in the, the center of the cube. And I would see bright all along the edges. And if I made the cube brighter in my left eye, this zone would kind of shrink. And if I made it uh, dimmer, then the zone would get bigger or disappear, and all I would see is uh, the dark cube just on its own. Um, and so basically, I was able to get a number, a measurement of how much my weak eye was suppressing. Um, and so I started uh, tracking that. And um, since then, that was uh, about five years ago, um, we, we built a system for, for treating, measuring and treating these things, and I tested it out on myself. Um, and so before starting, uh, the vision in my weak eye was about 2070. Uh, today I have pretty much normal vision. I have normal depth perception, normal vision in my, my weaker eye. Um, so that's kind of the difference of if I covered up my good eye, the letters on the top row were all I could read uh, five years ago, and today I can read um, uh, this, this row here. Um, and so what we actually built is a system for eye doctors to use VR headsets to treat their patients. Um, and the first system that we built was one that they use in their offices. So patients come in um, usually once or twice a week, and um, they play VR games, they take tests inside VR, and the doctor um, manages their treatment. Um, so right now we have treatment for a lot of different diseases, um, amblyopia, which is lazy eye, strabismus, which is crossed eye, uh, convergence disorders, um, which are uh, basically you have trouble reading, um, you might get double vision at near distances, uh, headaches, that sort of thing. Um, but we're also really interested in testing um, in a couple of other areas. And um, our platform is, uh, we're, we're cross-platform, we work on a lot of different headsets um, so people can kind of use the hardware um, they already own in some cases. 
Um, we've gone through regulatory processes in the U.S., in the EU, and in Australia. Um, right now we have more than 300 providers. We've treated more than 20,000 patients, um, and we're hoping to quickly increase that number in the coming years. Um, and more recently, um, we released Vivid Vision Home. So instead of, uh, or I guess the biggest problem of coming into the clinic is that it's really expensive. Um, if, if you're gonna go in seven times a month, they typically charge 100 to $200. Uh, most of this is out of pocket for people in the US. And so the average cost of treatment um, is typically around $10,000 in the US, uh, which most people just can't afford. Um, even if you can afford it, a lot of people have difficulty bringing their, their child in twice a week for half an hour, hour long session. Um, and so with Vivid Vision Home, they do some of the treatment in the office with our clinical system, um, but doctors can prescribe home treatment as well. And so instead of that seven visits, we can get that down to one visit every four to six weeks and do the rest of the treatment at home. Um, and our goal is to eventually um, make as much of the treatment uh, as possible managed remotely so that we can get the, the cost of the treatment under the typical insurance reimbursement. Um, and so a lot of people sort of think of lazy eye as an eye muscle problem. And for uh, many patients, um, eye muscle problems are involved. Um, but for more than half the patients, there's actually no problem at all with their eye muscle. It's really uh, a problem uh, where the brain has not developed vision properly. Um, usually there's some kind of physical problem with the eyes when the child's very young. So uh, the most typical cause is that they just need a really high prescription in one eye, so it's blurry, and the other eye is clear. And if you don't get them glasses while they're young, uh, their brain will just learn to ignore the weak eye and focus on the good vision coming in from the better eye. Um, and so what we do is we train the brain. We, we provide incentives for the brain to learn how to use the eyes better. Um, and so here's a... a Quick example, um, we do lots and lots of different things, um, but in general, we're increasing the signal strength of the input going to the weak eye, and we use games to kind of assign the goal to the brain of um, using the weak eye more. Um, so in this example, there's the ship, which is only in the right eye, uh, there's these sim uh, rings, which are in both eyes, and then the symbols inside the rings are only in the weak eye. And so in order to win this game, uh, the person's brain has to pay attention to where the ship is. They have to line up where the rings are because they have to fly the ship through the rings that are the blue up arrows and they have to avoid the ones that are the red down arrows. And they have to use their weak eye to read what the symbols are. And as they uh, correctly fly through the right rings, uh, we make it harder to read those symbols, we make them smaller, lower contrast. And we're kind of constantly taking a measurement of how well their weak eye um, is able to identify these symbols. Um, I won't go too much into detail uh, on, on this stuff, but um, it just kind of goes over some of the things we do. So anti-suppression, so getting it so that the uh, eye is no longer being ignored. Um, and some of the ways we do that are um, putting some of the objects in one, in their weak eye only, some in their good eye only, um, so that they have to pay attention to uh, the stuff in their weak eye. Um, some of our research um, at UC Berkeley has been on what we call a cue recruitment. So basically, we take cues for distance um, that they already use. Like, um, if you know how big a car is and you see a car at a certain size, you can estimate about how far away it is. Um, and so we'll take those cues that they know and we'll slowly pair them with the cues they don't use. Um, so over time, they learn that the cues they use are you know, statistically related to the ones they don't use, so we're kind of giving them information to jumpstart the process. Um, we'll often blur out the better eye, so we'll, uh, if, if their vision in their weak eye is, say, 2040, um, this is one of the things that their brain, um, that makes it so the brain wants to ignore it. So we'll blur the vision in their good eye to match the vision in their weak eye, and it makes it easier for them to focus on the stuff in their weak eye. Um, we do something we call virtual prism. Um, in the, the real world, they use prism lenses to move the angle of the image. And in VR, we just uh, move the image. And so um, if someone's eye is pointing out 10 degrees, we can move the one eye's image out 10 degrees, um, make it produce an environment where it's easier for them to see the images. Um, and then over time, we'll move it back to how they see 
uh, without the help. And then um, we use gaming and perceptual learning techniques. You know, I, I tend to think of what we're doing as, uh, it's like learning a lower level skill. It's, it's kind of closer to learning a language or a sport um, than it is to anything else. And so we use games to kind of keep people motivated to spend the, the number of hours they need to to, to learn the skill. Um, so here's an example of one of our activities. Um, and this activity, we're using some hand tracking. And uh, they have to pop uh, the bubble that's closest to them. Um, from our perspective, these bubbles look like they're all the same. But from their perspective, there's one at the back that's twice as big as the one up, uh, that's uh, front. And so they have the same angular size, um, but one's significantly closer. And so they're always picking the closer one. Um, for the doctor's view, uh, we highlight the bubble in green, which is the correct answer. And so we're, we're getting a measurement of their depth perception. And at the same time, we can control stuff like um, how bright the outline is, how thick it is, how large the bubbles are, where the bubbles appear on the eye. Um, and so we'll make it easier at first by making them really big and pushing them out to be more peripheral where their suppression is less, things like that. Um, so this is one of our newer games. This is for treating uh, what's convergence insufficiency. So basically, people have a hard time pointing their eyes uh, at, or looking at near targets. And so what we do in this game is they have to uh, control the chicken to jump up these platforms. And we're adjusting the angle of the um, cameras to make it more and more difficult. They have to look closer and closer um, while they're doing the task. And then um, every so often, we bring up these uh, golden eggs, where the chicken is now only in the right eye, the eggs are only in the left eye, and they have to collect them. So we're getting a measurement of how well their eyes are lined up um, while they're doing this. And then based on that measurement, we'll make it easier or harder as they play the rest of the game. Um, so we have uh, published a couple of studies. We're planning on publishing more um, soon. And the results from this study, um, basically the dark bars are the percentage of the patients that came in with um, various levels of, of depth perception. Um, so about half the patients came in uh, before our treatment with no measurable, measurable depth perception at all. Um, and only about 11% of the patients had no measurable depth perception after the treatment. Um, this group of patients was actually between 15 and 55. Um, we focused more of our initial research on adults, because um, it's a, a bit more controversial that you can improve the vision of adults. Um, but our future research uh, that we're going to be publishing will be both adults and kids. Um, so now, uh, something that's, that's really interesting to me is we have a lot of data. Um, and we're starting to analyze our data to figure out what treatments are best for which kinds of patients. Um, so we have more than 300 clinics. We've treated more than 20,000 patients. Um, we've logged more than 20 million events in our database. Um, and so we're starting to sift through that to try to understand um, you know, which decisions or settings that the doctors are, are using result in the best outcomes for which patients. Um, and so this is an example of, of some data. Um, we haven't published this yet, um, but uh, it's from 1,000 patients who have each logged 30 sessions. So it's uh, more than 30,000 sessions. And um, uh, before we start session one, we measure the, their current depth perception. And this is um, the activity being done is that bubbles game I showed earlier. Um, and by Session 30, we keep measuring their depth perception um, at each session. And we see that, on average, across all 1,000 of these patients, their depth perception about doubled um, in 35 to 10 minute sessions. <coughs> so w the work we're doing now is to try to um, dig down a little deeper and look at uh, some of the patients didn't improve at all. Some of them improved a lot more than this. And we're going to try to go back and figure out why it is that some patients improve a lot more quickly than others. Um, 
So, so far I've been talking about Lazy Eye. Um, our second product that is not yet on the market, but um, that we're currently going through clinical validation for is a perimeter. Um, so basically it's a visual field test. It, it measures if there's any decreased vision anywhere across the retina. Um, the most common use for this test is in uh, glaucoma. And so if you've ever taken that test where you put your head into a bowl and you press the button, if you see a light flash, um, we're basically trying to replace that test. Um, so here is a woman with glaucoma um, who's taking the test for the first time. And so um, this is the test layout. We actually have some newer test layouts um, that we're currently validating. And basically what they have to do is you, you use your head to control this orange cursor. Every time you see uh, the circle, you move your head to bring the cursor into the circle. Um, when you reach the circle, we flash a stimulus somewhere in your vision. And if you see it, you move your cursor to where you saw it. If you don't see it, you just stand still and do nothing. Um, and so basically patients are telling us where they saw uh, different uh, dark uh, stimuli. And so um, this is the first time um, she took the test. And on the bottom, these are her, um, her uh, results from the standard way of doing this test. And then we're showing a buildup of our results as she goes through and, and takes the test. Um, and the biggest difference, um, there's a couple of differences, but I, I think the biggest one is that we're doing this on $200 hardware. The tests that they typically do this on cost between twenty and fifty thousand dollars for the machine, um, and so we're planning on um, releasing this product as, as an at-home uh, monitor for glaucoma. A lot of patients with glaucoma are older, um, and going into the office to get the test they need is difficult. Um, it's also suggested that people take three tests per year once they've been identified as a glaucoma suspect and um, insurance only reimburses for two tests per year. Um, and so we're, we're trying to make the, the amount of data collected for people who do have glaucoma or may have glaucoma uh, be significantly higher and easier to collect. And um, so one of, one of the ways that we're validating the accuracy of this test um, is by uh, testing on the, our own blind spots. Um, and even people who have normal vision have a, a actually quite large blind spot in each eye. Um, the moon is about half a degree. Uh, this, these blind spots are normally five degrees wide. So you could fit 10 moons in, in your vision and they'll just disappear if you put your eye in the right place. Um, and so these are quite large blind spots that, that everyone has. Uh, these are uh, blood vessels coming out of the blind spot that supply blood to the eye. Um, and so we have a test pattern where um, we center it where we expect the blind spot to be. These little gray dots, zoomed in, um, are where we test. This pink dot is the center of where we expect it to be, and that never changes between tests. And so um, when we first did our test, we got results like this. And uh, we were not sure what these little uh, lines coming off the center are. Um, it's typical to be able to measure the blind spot, um, but what we figured out was that those lines are actually the blood vessels coming out of the blind spot. And we were um, had enough accuracy to actually measure where the blind or where the blood vessels are coming out of the eye. And so we were interested if we could go even find our resolution. Um, these are at, uh, I think, 0.3 degree spacings. And so we did it again, and we're actually able to land several test locations in between these blood vessels. Um, and for reference, the, the standard tests typically test four degrees apart. And so we're testing, you know, 12 times higher resolution or something like that. Um, and we did some more where we thought, well, uh, normally you only see missed spots in healthy people if you uh, test within the blind spot but we wanted to know if we followed out uh, the blood vessels we were seeing in these images, if we'd measure it there, there too, and we did. And so um, that's all the time I have today. I'm happy to answer questions um, after the session. Um, I have like ha uh, 30 seconds if someone wants to. Do you see, uh, with adults that have been treated, do you see the change 
persist over time or do they need to keep up treatment in order for the, uh, especially the binocular vision to persist? Um, so yeah, so does, does the treatment um, persist in adults after they stop? Um, we're, we're collecting some data on this now at, at, at UC Berkeley, so we don't, um, I don't have data to back this up, but what, I, what we believe based on what we've seen is that um, once you're using the eye in everyday life, once you're no longer suppressing it, then it's unlikely it's gonna revert. But if you don't get that far, then it's very likely it's gonna revert. So I think it's, it's kind of like an atrophied muscle. If you exercise it to the point where you're using it all the time, then you're probably good. But if you don't get to that point, um, you probably need to keep going. How, how are the, the general practicing population of clinicians, optometrists, opticians, how are they responding to it? Are they, um, you know, like approachable about this treatment? Yeah, um, so how are clinicians responding to it? Initially, they were skeptical. We were a small company. They had never heard of us. You know, most of them don't even use electronic health records. You know, they're still using pen and paper to keep track of their health records. Um, so there was some skepticism at first. I think there's also a belief though, that they should be modernizing and using better technology. And so the resistance we've seen is more on a practical level than it is on a conceptual level. I, I think people, the, the field is excited about advancements like this, and um, I think as people have gotten used to us and our company and what we're presenting, they're more willing to take the risk of learning a new technology and teaching their staff and that sort of thing. Thanks. All right, let's give James a round of applause.